through James and Christian's honesty and craft, uh, tonight we are given an account of service, of sacrifice, despair, hope, reconnection, and recovery. And through all of this, also given a story of love and support from those around James, both human and canine. And hopefully through hearing James's stories, we can also hopefully help be better understand and help people who are in trouble around us. So let me turn this over to James and to Christian. Thank you. Thank Thanks for coming. I don't really know. Uh, I've never been to a book signing, actually, until uh, this happened. So uh, I talked to Bill a little bit, and my friend Christian's very talented. So I think between the two of us, we can, we can entertain for a little bit. Uh, I would say that uh, this was a really difficult process because I went back and forth, I don't know, at least a dozen times. And Christian was, you know, kind of my confessor. Through it all, we were friends prior to uh, me doing anything in combat, and then uh, after I got hurt, he, like some of the fellows that are here, came and spent some time with me in the hospital up here at Bethesda, and uh, so he went through some of the really difficult stuff with me, so when I finally got around to the point where I could think about it, I, I was really happy that he was still willing to put up with me and, uh, and to do this. So I think it's turned out really well. He's very smart. If I had been uh, the one writing this, it would have been in crayon. <laughs> yeah, so we're really lucky. No, I always love to challenge Jimmy. And let me put it to you this way. If it were true that if you were to write this book, it would be in crayon, would you have been able to come up with a phrase as clever as that? <laughs> right? Probably not. So you, you reveal your own frailty there. You're actually, he's a very intelligent guy, very gifted literarily, I would say as well. The one interesting point about all of this, and his introduction was pretty apt, is I've known him for a long time, and I've always known that he, as a human being, is a great fellow. I love him and I admire him, but I've also always known, as have friends of his, that his story is quite unusual. And it's a story that I have long felt, as I think many have, it's a story that's well worth telling, not just because it's action-packed or exciting or entertaining, but because it's actually important. And it's been a very interesting process with Jimmy because I've known this for 13, 14 years, but I've never wanted to push and say to a guy like him, hey, tell your story, hey, do, let's do your story. So I would say it was actually true that you came around eventually and said you were ready to do it. And I think one interesting thing that you might want to start by addressing is what changed from I don't want to write this book, I don't want to tell my story, it's not worth it, to it is worth it, I do want to tell the story, and here's why. See how that works? <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> uh, so I think where I changed my mind about doing the book is I'd, I was invited by a friend, another SEAL, who had gotten out and was um, had started a business that was helping, um, in this particular case, the Boston Fire Department. And so I went up to talk about... Um, the industry calls it resiliency, which I hate. That's an overused word. And and we've created an industry about just taking care of each other. Uh, I feel very strongly about that. <clears throat> so I went up there to talk, and they actually used that word, and I was bristling at it. But after I did a speech with these firefighters and their families, I people actually came up and said, hey, man, you need to write a book. And I remember, I remember flying home and thinking, gosh, i got to do it now. I hope Christian is not angry at me for coming to him again and say, hey, we should write a book. That's how it happened. Do you know, how many of you are familiar with the story, generally speaking? Nobody? Do you want me to give a 30-second overview of what actually happens in the book? It might help. So just, it's about Jimmy Hatch, who's right here. He's an unusual guy, and long story short, he was in that unusual counter-terror unit in the Navy, which means they go out every night and conduct high-pressure, high-intensity, capture kill raids to get the big targets of this country. Did it for a long time, and he enjoyed it. He was satisfied, he was fulfilled, it was his calling. He was living at what he calls a high frequency of life, right? So he's at a high frequency, and even though it was shot through with darkness and horror at times and violence, he also found a kind of refuge there. He found his calling there, and he found pure moments, genuinely pure moments, where he was linked with the guys in his squad, he was connected in a way, he was doing what he, basically feels he's on earth to do. And so here you have a guy, classic storyline, living life completely fulfilled and intensely. He gets shot trying to rescue Bo Bergdahl, the fellow who walked off his base. And after he gets shot, he plummets. 
ejected from the life that he was familiar with and that he loved, um, all of a sudden haunted by a lot of the stuff that had been building up over the course of the previous 15 years, and he goes like this. I'm going to demonstrate with my hand the story arc. Are you ready? It's very simple. It's up here. Let me use this, actually. <laughs> so it's up here. This golden ball is Jimmy, OK? <laughs> this golden ball is Jimmy. And here's Jimmy, high frequency, shot, going after Bergdahl, straight down, ends up with a gun in his mouth, and he's disarmed by his wife at home. Bottoms out, hits absolute rock bottom. Long story short, he is essentially, for the most part, saved and resuscitated by friends and by a handful of tools that friends have given him. So it's this, that's his story. And he's here, he's not back at pure gold, he's the first one to tell you that, but he's still rebounding. And the reason, thank you, sir. And the reason the book is important is because what has helped him, what has saved him, here's the interesting part for me, can help and save many of us. It's not just about, hey, you have to be from a certain intense unit and you have to be a wounded veteran in order to be rehabilitated by these tools. Every one of us in this room has some kind of pain, I'd imagine, or some kind of hurt or shame. And this book is about what are those tools that can get you out of that. And curiously enough, he's the guy that you will come to trust to impart those tools to you. It's really extraordinary. I mean, I've actually undergone this process in writing the book with him where you learn that some of these tools he uses can benefit us. I just wanted to set that stage up front. It's not just about veterans. It's not just about war. It's about much more than that. Was that a good summary? OK. Now you know. It was really uh, fun and very difficult writing uh, with Christian. Fun because I know his mind is uh, rare and exceptional. Difficult because I mentioned earlier he's like a confessor. So we would uh, he rented a flat in uh, Richmond in this place uh, called the Triangle, right? So I don't know much. It's just the fan. The that's fan. It, the fan. And so I would drive up there. We would meet and we'd start talking about things. And I thought I had kind of gone through all the stuff that was difficult. But as we were putting the story together, I discovered that there were things that I was struggling with. So the fun part was <laughs> giving him a hard time as a way to kind of vent because I was going through all these stresses in my head, and he put up with it really well. But he's a vagabond. He, he lives like a gypsy. He has, like, he lives out of his car. It's probably parked out there right now with a cup of coffee in it and a bagel from this morning. And my family. <laughs> I'm kidding. My family's not in my It was car. awesome. <laughs> it was really fun, uh, but it was really difficult, too. I'm, the process itself was Touching the Dragon. That's, like, the title uh, when I was locked up uh, after my little suicidal antics. Uh, the psychologist that had been working with me knew that he could use, I guess it's basically cognitive behavioral therapy. So essentially I had to relive things. And I, he brought a legal pad. And I, he didn't want to do it prior to me being locked up because he was afraid that it would be too much pressure and that I would not deal with it well. And he was right. So when I was locked up, he said, ah, it's too late. Now we got you, right? So I would write, you know, and the one we talk about, I think, is the, the night that I got hurt. <clears throat> Excuse me. I felt like I made some mistakes. And that I could have done this better or that better. I blame myself for the dog getting killed and putting my buddies in danger and the helicopter crew that had to come get me in a really mean firefight, put them all at risk. And I couldn't forgive myself because I felt like if I'd have done something differently, uh, we would that wouldn't have happened. But the truth was, after I went through it again and again and again, because the psychologist is a smart guy, he, he had me write it down and I did it in about three paragraphs and he said no 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 that's not gonna do it. Let's take it to a half an hour before you went on the mission till you woke up in Germany. And so I did it, and then he said, okay, now I want to know what you smelled, what you heard, and I want you to break it down even more. So it ended up being about six pages finally, and it took about a week. And I realized at the end of it, he said, now listen, you've done all of this. You've looked at it based on your experiences. Now, of course, I don't have, uh, I'm not abusing substances, so I can think clearly. I've gone through all of this. I'm under observation. He said, would you, do you still think you messed up? And I said, no, I'd, I'd do what I did again. And I've, I've applied that again and again, touching the dragon. That's what I called it. I call him the dragon tamer. He's a brave guy. When I was locked up, he wouldn't do it sitting in a room with me. <laughs> Jimmy, tell them why you call it touching the dragon, what that means. Dragon's scary, and uh, you got to confront it, the, the scary things. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to go down those roads, you know, but you have to if you're going to move on. 
So imagine that there's something in your past that haunts you, that you're ashamed of. Most of us have those things. <clears throat> one way of handling them is by not handling them, by ignoring them, pretending that they don't exist. And one of the things we say in the book, thanks to Jimmy's experience, is that I think we believe, and Jimmy believes, that shame that stays a secret will kill you. If you have a deep shame and you keep it a secret for long enough, it'll find a way to destroy you. So imagine that shame, this is Jimmy's trope, imagine that shame, that hurt, that mistake you made is a dragon. And why is it a dragon? And this is Jimmy's archetype. It's a dragon because it's going to burn you. You fear that if you confront it, if you open that wound, if you look at it, if you dive into that mistake you made, it's going to incinerate you and destroy you. But the truth is, if you have the courage to walk up to that dragon and touch it, it does not burn you, it does not kill you. And that's actually one of the tools that the book gives people, I think, to use in order to help them deal with their own problems. And by the way, one other anecdote I wanted to share is I was at an event with Jimmy where he was talking. This is apropos of why the book will have an impact. And it was a bunch of people on the verge of graduating from a fairly august organization. And they were shiny, and they were young, and they were optimistic, and the world was at their feet. And there was a woman who was the organizer, and she was basically a goddess. She was like Captain America. She was extraordinary. Um, and she had the whole thing dialed, and Jimmy gets up, and they know the unit that Jimmy's from, and the, so they're sort of expecting this is gonna be a cool guy talking about his cool unit and how cool he is. And Jimmy gets up there and says, I was in the Navy, now let me tell you about how broken I was. And I'm like, what? And then he just does what he does, and he pours out in a very shockingly candid way just how broken he was after the event. People surrounded him and were talking to him, and I was nearby so I could hear, this woman walked up to you, and this is actually in the book. She walks up and says, hey, Jimmy, can I talk to you offline for a moment later on? And Jimmy said, sure. The next morning, they got together. And long story short, she essentially said her plan was to basically kill herself. And bear in mind, this is Captain America. I'm not really exaggerating. She's a one she looked like she had it figured out. And her message to you was, I am well, ashamed of something. Something bad happened and I don't have anybody to tell. I think it's embarrassing to talk about. So I was basically gonna self-destruct, but if you, because of who you are, if you have the guts to admit how broken you were, maybe it's not so disgraceful if I admit that I'm broken too. And that transition from I'm ashamed to talk about it to I wanna talk about it can be, I think, the difference between life and death. That's a bit dramatic, but not that dramatic. I had never heard the word archetype. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. W our editor said to, to me one time, she said, you know, it's too colloquial. And I'm like, Christian, what does that mean? What is colloquial? It's awesome. This By is the way, there's, there's one funny thing about working together. Uh, for Jim, it was difficult because this book is called Touching the Dragon. And revisiting a lot of these stories was, as you just mentioned, itself touching the dragon. He had to go back to things that he thought he'd maybe dealt with, but some of them were quite traumatic. And we went late into the night as he reflected on them. For me, it was basically a great pleasure and a privilege to work with him. There was only one problem with our collaboration. He's a great fellow and I admire him, but when he came to the fan and would stay with me and we'd write together, you're living closely, compacted, you're in intimate space together, you're, I'm in his psyche, I'm in his head, that talk about intimacy, right? And um, the only problem was our work with him because I like to get up early and he likes to kind of lollygag, sleep in, you know, kind of kick around, roll out of bed at 11 a.m. I, I haven't told you this before, but that was basically the only problem I have with collaborating with you, was your discipline. It was a little bit lax. I mean, I like to be up at 5 a.m. and get things cooking. But now you know. I just figured this would be a good occasion to bring that up. You don't think I'll hit you in front of you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, actually, the joke was I'd be up at 7, patting myself on the back for the early rise. And he's been up since 4. He's, you know cooked breakfast, built a small hut in the corner, it's got a fire going off in the fireplace. So my attempts at being an early riser to match you failed miserably, but that's okay. I will say one thing about that. Uh, Christian lacks something that a lot of humans have, and that is the ability to say, ah, that's good enough. He doesn't have that. So he may have slept a lot. <laughs> that's not true. He's just a late guy, and I'm a real early guy. The military kind of did that to me. Uh, it was difficult working with him because there's not a lot of mistakes in there. And he made me, th you know, really <laughs> work through things and be uh, just true. That's the only word I can really think of. And uh, it's a quality, I think, timeless, honestly, 
story that he put together, um, throwing things that I had said about my experiences into a bowl, and he kind of stirred it up, and he calls it the connective tissue, the way it's structured, and then the ending. Uh, the ending is amazing. Um, don't go there first. You won't get it. <laughs> but he came up with it. It's a, I'm really proud. I'm really proud of it. Well, one thing I'd say about that is if you have any inclination to write, one of the things, of course, you want to have access to, when we wrote it together, he'll always say that uh, he wasn't involved, but of course he was, massively. And he actually has a literary gift, and I'm not kidding. But one of the things about Jimmy that's interesting is the stories that come out of him are extraordinary. And it's not just that it's action man, superhero type stuff. I think what you'll find is there's about 130 pages of the war, the wars that you were in. I think every one of those is a modular unit. And call me on this if I'm wrong, or call us on, us, us on it if we're wrong. But I genuinely, believe, I genuinely believe that the finale of every one of those episodes will surprise you. You, you think you might know where it's going. You think you might have seen it in a book previously. But I can almost assure you, in fact, I, I, I can assure you that the finale of every one of those modular units of war is surprising because of him and because of the guys that he's with and because of the perspective that they have on it. They are unusual guys, and yet they're the last ones on Earth to thump and beat their chests and say, aren't we wonderful, aren't we tough? There are moments of humanity in there that surprise people who read the book delicate touches that happen in the middle of chaos and violence. And it has to be said that a lot of that happens because Jimmy is different. Jimmy is attuned to be able to function at that level in that world. And yet he's also got what I would call kind of a delicate soul, which might sound funny, but you do. You have a sense. He's got a sensitive soul. <laughs> Out comes the club. Um, he has to mask his sensitive soul with those little shows of macho, you see? Um, I'm kidding. But he has a sensitive soul, and people who know you would agree with that, and it makes for surprising reading. And I can assure you that you'll be stunned by the war beats, because it's not, hey, we're tough. We went out there, and we were really tough and great. It's the polar opposite of that. In fact, he has contempt for that. He has contempt for people who video gamify and, and machoify war and glorify killing and glorify violence. He knows violence, and he understands better than anybody the horrors and the fallout from it. And that's part of the candor he brings to the storytelling process, which is critical. And one of the things I wanted to say about why the book matters, we kind of touched on it because it'll help people, but one other thing about Jimmy, and I'm just going to say it, this is praise and you'll find a way to deflect it, but um, I think it's important for people to read this book and meet Jimmy for a number of reasons. One of them is because we live in an age, I guess we always have, where sometimes the people we admire, our heroes, our leaders, or whomever, they'll disappoint us. They cloak themselves in virtue, they seem awesome, they seem great, and then it turns out that they're maybe crooked, or they embezzled, or they did this, or did th they did that. And it hurts us because it's a kind of hypocrisy. Not all prominent folks, but some. What I realized this morning driving here was that you are the polar opposite of hypocrisy. Just think about what that might mean. You are. I did a little watch, he'll say, no, that's not true. <laughs> but in this book, you, there's not a, a drop of hypocrisy. You are candid, you are authentic, you admit failings better than anybody I, I've seen. And that's an amazing thing to encounter, somebody who is the opposite of hypocrisy. I'll let you discover what that actually means. But that's an insight I had this morning about you, sir. What do you think? I think we should let them ask questions. Fair enough. <laughs> I, seriously, I, I don't, I've never been to a book signing. Uh, we had one the other day at a business that has helped my little nonprofit. And so I don't really know how these work. I talked to Bill and he kind of coached me along, but I think the exchange is where I really feel good. I mean, questions or any anything that you'd, yes sir. The tattoo, which one? I have a few. I'll tell you what, <clears throat> the one you can't see, it's up here. So in the 90s, I was I was reading the, the Tao Te Ching, right? It's a Taoist little, Chinese philosophy kind of book, yeah. And I was a bodyguard for a guy in Bosnia, in Sarajevo. And there was a, there was a, um, a, a year before I got there, or maybe 18 months before I got there with this person that I was being a bodyguard for, uh, they had dropped a mortar on a line of people who were trying to get bread. So Sarajevo was really a rough spot for about five years. And so the last part of it, um, 
somebody dropped a mortar on this line of people in line for bread, these people that were hungry. And there was a young woman in that line who uh, was hit with a piece of shrapnel in the back of her head. And there's an organization that I'm sure you're probably familiar with, Medicine Sans Frontieres, and they, Doctors Without Borders, they took this young lady and flew her to high court, flew her to Paris, and fixed her up, did, did the surgeries on her head. And then at the after she started to heal up, they said, hey, what are you good at? You know, we need to give you some tools so that when you go back to Bosnia, you can, you know, you can live a good life. And she said, well, I'm a good artist. And they said, have you ever thought about doing tattoos? And she said, no. She said, they said, well, there's a lot of soldiers there now and they like tattoos and it might be a good business. So guess what? That's what she was doing. And when I met her, she had a line out the door of, of soldiers and I was one of them. And so that, that was the Dao De Jing one. This is just really, my favorite poet is Neruda. You'll read about that in the book. And when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in, I think it was 1971 or 72, I can't remember. He said, through blood and darkness, poetry is written. So that's what that says. These are names of dogs um, that were killed overseas with me. And then, I don't know, this is just... I don't know what the skulls are about. Does that answer it? <laughs> How long was your collaboration? Or did you talk about that before? I actually came? think we've been collaborating since we became friends. And I've, that's actually how we became friends, was collaborating. I, had to, I, was, I was taking an online college course. I dropped out of high school. So uh, I was asked to write an essay. And the guys, he was actually making a documentary film, and the guy said, hey, that guy went to Harvard. You should talk to him. He can help you with your homework. I said, hey, man, can you help me with an essay? And he said, sure. So he came by my house later, and I'll never forget it, man. He walks in, and he's like, so do you have any three-by-five cards? And I said, yeah. So I went and got some, and he had a pen, and I said, this is the book that we're doing. And he starts walking around, and he's got the cards, and he's like, now what do they want to know? What do they, let's get to the meat of it. And I'm like, holy cow, like this guy... He's, this is an essay. He's like acting like it's a mission that I go on, you know? So uh, I think we've been collaborating since then, honestly. It's a lucky thing because Jimmy is temperamental, and so he's prone to moments of discarding all memorabilia, all records of anything, all photos, and I've kept them all, which helps because when we had to access the archives and consult images and so forth, I'd say, hey, Jimmy, do you have that photo from 2009? He'd say, no, I deleted my hard drive. In a moment of peak, I just got rid of it all. I wanted to be clean, so luckily I kept it. So I've also been the unofficial archivist of Jimmy Hatch, <laughs> which is not something I set out to be, but that's the way it ended up. I have a question for Jimmy which is uh, you, you have an unusual bond with dogs. It's, uh, it's extraordinary, um, like nothing I've ever heard about or experienced. Um, and my intuition is that it has something to do with the fact that your bond has been in a context of extreme violence. Could you tell, tell me, us, something about that bond you have? Yeah, I'll try to do that without getting too emotional, but uh, I don't talk about my childhood much, uh, and I didn't want to, but Christian put me in, you know, look at his biceps. He put me in a headlock, and he said, hey, <laughs> you're going to talk about it a little bit. So uh, I, I was adopted a few times, and I ended up, you know, running away and things like that. So I felt as though I was a bit of a vagabond, and I kind of got put where I was put out of luck or some other unnatural cause. Dogs are similar, a lot. Uh, like the dogs that I worked with. They were born and they had s a certain physical abilities and they ended up being, you know, assigned to either like law enforcement or, or the military and, you know, they just kind of got caught up in it. And I felt, no, and there were some def definite decision-making processes during my progress through the military, but I felt a similar... I love them. They're pure. They can't really lie to you, you know? Uh, they don't... I was really, actually, it's as apropos current events. Somebody in, in the political leadership said something about people being animals, and, and they referred to them, uh, be, you know, f doing things like cutting people and, you know, violence, and, and I feel like that's kind of bad, because animals don't do that to each other. <laughs> you know, they don't. And dogs are, of course, you know, among my favorite 
Uh, I, and I also feel as though I owe them. Like they don't understand bullets. They just know that they're with their crew and that we're going to go out and, and we're going to do our work together. And so, <clears throat> I, you know, it's not really fair to them. Now, does that answer it? That was a long answer. Yes, ma'am. You just talked about your dream. <coughs> Excuse me. You worked together with the dog. What was what was that? What was the dog doing with you? And how did he? Okay, so we went. My job was to capture or kill people that were doing horrible things. So <coughs> dogs have their senses are extremely uh, important in environments where there are explosives or people could hide. So we would use them to help us not get killed, basically. To find bombs or to find people that were out to hurt us or others. So, you know, bad, violent stuff. Uh, and they saved a bunch of us. These stars, this is the logo for my nonprofit, and each one of these stars represents a dog that I was with that died in combat. So we lost a lot of them. You know, uh, people wearing suicide vests. The dogs would find them hiding in a house, getting ready to blow themselves up, and then the dog would bite them and they'd blow themselves up. So the dog would get killed. And that's one example. Can I offer a follow-up to that? Which is, so Jimmy went basically and he fought with these dogs, right? And he loved these dogs, he sees himself in these dogs, and he connects with their spirit and feels it very powerfully, as you just explained. But one of the other interesting things you'll see in the book is that, and he alluded to it a moment ago, he dislikes the fact that they get caught up in our violence, that they love him and they're his colleague, as it were, or partner, and they're out there, but they don't really know what they're getting into, whereas Jimmy does. They, they're accustomed, perhaps, to violence, but one of the ways that you tried to mitigate that unfairness a little bit, I think, is by not sitting back and say, all right, dog, you run over there and we'll hang back. And you see what you can find. I think one of the ways you attempt to mitigate that, and this says a lot about Jimmy in a lot of ways, is that he would run as fast as he could after the dog to be there with the dog. So it wasn't just the dog being sent into danger or harm's way under his own power. Jimmy tried over and over and over and over again to get there too. I think that's fair to say. It is, but there's something I should add to that. You're not as fast as the dog. This dogs. might be a little unpleasant, but hi, Dana. Uh, I liked the violence, right? And I liked being close. And the dog has really good senses. And so if the dog starts running, he's up to something good. And I know I get to be involved in it. So that was part of the reason why I was chasing him so fast. Because I enjoyed that. Just for a little, uh, for a little light note, because I, I know the story, and I think everybody else here would like to know it too. i like Christian to tell it first. How did you guys meet each other? Well, uh, most folks looking at us think that they can figure out what I think drew you to me, which is my excessive levels of macho that I exude. And just Jimmy is like, I got to be around that as much as I possibly can. Um, is, that, is that what you're referring to? No. So no, we met while he, he mentioned it. We were uh, in Arizona and we were on a base where he worked. He was a free fall instructor and he taught people how to fall out of planes and fly their bodies as they fell uh, across enemy lines. And I was making a documentary and basically I was in a bus and everyone in the bus said, hey, if you're really doing a documentary about the school, the dude you have to meet is the guy driving the bus right over there, Jimmy. Jimmy was cruising along. They go, Jimmy's the really special guy. And I said, that's great, the guy who's carting us along. That's right, that's the guy I need to go meet. And, you know, there's, well, I won't tell were you the guy that did the carabiner trick on me in the plane? No. Okay. Then I won't tell that story. But, um, but that's where we met. We met in Arizona while he was an instructor at a particular school. I guess Aleko wasn't really listening earlier when I was talking about how we met, so <laughs> he helped me. Yeah, I was driving the bus because I got in trouble. <laughs> so it, when you when you were a free fall instructor and you you know you love jumping out of airplanes, so when you do something wrong, you need to be disciplined. You don't get to jump out of airplanes. I had done some a few things wrong, and so I was assigned to drive the bus, which I actually got in trouble for while I was doing that because. <laughs> They had, on the base, they had this little radar thing set up where it says, your speed is, right? So I would get all the students on the bus, and there was a turn right there, and I wanted to see if I could hit that turn. The speed limit was 25 miles an hour, but I wanted to see if I could hit it at 70. So I would make <laughs> all the students get on one side of the bus so the bus didn't flip, <laughs> and I, I attempted to get to 70. 
That's the story. Yes, sir. Mike. Jimmy, um, I'm closer to the Vietnam uh, situation than what you guys uh, have gone through. And a lot of the vets have gone back to Vietnam uh, to meet with the people, meet the people that they're fighting against. Can you see yourself doing that? I actually, I actually would like to. Uh, and there's a section in the book. A friend of mine, a skydiver, who's the actual son of the Saudi ambassador to the United States in the Carter administration. He and he went to school here at Georgetown, actually. But he now lives in Dubai, and uh, I'll let you read it in the book. But he really wanted me to go back to that part of the world, and so Dubai is certainly not Iraq. Uh, there may be some clothing similarities here and there, but it was a definitely. Um, emotional. I would definitely like to go back to those places. You know, the culture in Iraq, I didn't get to see it, you know, and it's there. You know, I mean, it's an amazing place. Afghanistan is as well. It's just, it's very, they're very, very different. And I would definitely like to go back. Afghanistan, I grew up in Utah and Afghanistan's a lot like Utah. It's really mountainous in parts of it. And then in the southern part, it's, you know, desert, arid. The people are amazing. Resilient, tough. Did I just say resilient? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Why didn't you get to see a lot of these parts of the world? We just worked at night, so we'd go out and when the sun was coming up, we were running. You can hear that call to prayer, the first call to prayer in the morning. That was time to get the heck out of there. Does that answer it? I would like to go back. I think right now I'd still get my head cut off. Maybe before too long we can do that. Hi, so um, I love how you talk about being able to talk and how that sort of un unlocking the bad things that may have happened to you may help you heal. But I find that, actually I was just talking to a friend today whose brother has PTSD, he served in the military, and we actually don't know any details about it because he's not allowed to talk about it. And um, same actually with my brother-in-law, you know, a lot of areas where they can't talk about it. And I come from a field where we can't really talk about things either that we do. And so, do you see the needle moving? in the military you know, aspects about you know, how you can actually get over these things. Because I, I mean, there are so many people who I think, some of them are less affected than others, but certainly it does burn you in the end. You know. I agree, so I, 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 hopefully I have your question correct, but is there room in an environment where communicating these things is not uh, appropriate? It, it's incumbent upon the people in that environment to help each other out, and that's exactly what happened to me. So the night I was wounded, there were a couple of guys who took particular risk to help me, stop me from bleeding to death, and then help me out getting on the helicopter to get out of there. And then later on, when I was at my low point uh, with the gunplay and all of that, the, they showed, those same guys showed up, and, and one of them actually flew me to a mental institution and convinced me to stay there because I needed to do it. And... Because of what happened with me, I think in my unit, and I've been told this by guys there, it's now not as rare for people to say, yeah, I need to go talk to somebody. Look, here's the thing. <clears throat> in, in our vocation, we work as, for the most part, we work as a team. And <clears throat> in order to be effective as a team, everybody's got to be healthy. So in the military, we, we frame that with physical fitness, you know, running and you know, whatever, swimming, whatever your, whatever your vocation needs, right? So, but it's the same with law enforcement or fire department. Everybody's got to be working together or people can die, really. So what I think is important is that not only do you need to be in shape physically, but you need to be firing on all cylinders mentally. Everybody in your crew does. And if they're not, then it can cause problems for the group. So I think the military is improving. Uh, especially the smaller units that do crazier stuff. Uh, I do a lot of speeches for different groups, and right now I think law enforcement is the absolute most difficult place for it, and they're about 10 years behind the military, and I, and I really worry about them. Uh, I think it's just a conversation that needs to be, this, we just need to be transparent. Because if there's... There's people sitting in this room right now that think, ah, everything's great. Well, just give it a minute. <laughs> you know? I mean, go out and be on your way home and somebody's texting and boom, you're, you're in an accident or something. I mean, I think it's just a matter of time before you're going to have to struggle with things and just need to figure out how to make it okay. Does that answer it? Okay.
you tell us more about your nonprofit organization? So uh, I mentioned my uh, admiration for the dogs. So uh, we take care of working dogs. Uh, most of the dogs we help to take care of are law enforcement. We also, we also help out with military dogs occasionally. And we do a couple of things. Uh, first off, we provide equipment. And the thing I think that we're probably best known for are ballistic vests. So uh, dogs are often put in really violent situations, specifically in law enforcement. Uh, and I live in Norfolk, Virginia, just down the road. And we had a dog that was biting a guy who had assaulted his wife, and he had a gun. And the guy shot the dog twice and killed him. And that was the impetus to start, we call it the Canine Krieger campaign. So that's one facet of our uh, operation. The other, the other more important one, we provide other equipment as well, like heat alarms. More dogs, working animals are actually killed in heat-related incidents because the officers get called to do something, the engine in the car stalls or the air conditioner breaks and the dog's in the car. So that's a, that's a problematic issue that we have. So there's technology out there that we'll purchase for, in fact, we just purchased, it's called a hop and, a hot and pop. So when the car reaches a certain temperature, the officer will get a text on his phone. And if there's no response within a certain amount of time and the temperature rises, it rolls the windows down in the car and then it pops the door so the dog will survive it. So we also help out with medical expenses. So uh, like humans, when the dogs uh, retire, uh, they have to go to the doctor more, <laughs> right? So they get, they've been getting beat up like we do in our jobs. And then when they retire, they don't often get adopted by people who can afford a lot of that medical care. So we help out with that. And we've actually helped some working dogs in smaller communities in the Midwest in particular where the community doesn't have the money to take care of the dog the way it should be taken care of. So they, if they're working on behalf of humans, then we need to take care of them. And that's my mission. So we've helped out dogs in 44 states. My goal by the end of the year is to help dogs in all states. And uh, we've helped just over 570 dogs. And my goal is by the end of the year, that's why you guys need to buy a lot of books, is to have helped 750. That's the goal by the end of the year. But there are 22,000 working canine groups in the United States, 22,000. Oh, sorry. We've, we've got an awful lot of medical brain power in this area around D.C. with NIH and the installations you were at. Anything about your care that you'd change? Wow. I think I think I the one thing that I would change is <clears throat> I would make, again, like I mentioned earlier, I would make it more transparent. It's okay that you struggle with things. You know, and um, I understand there's a need for privacy. Not everybody's comfortable like I am talking about doing all this crazy stuff. But I also think we need to, like, just take, just stop fooling ourselves a little bit and be a little bit more transparent about the whole issue of mental health. But I, as far as, like, the people that I worked with, I was, I was well treated. Is it in, in law and or regulation now that servicemen get an, an exit interview? Am I missing that? Yeah, but, uh, you do, but here's the thing. <laughs> you know, you if you're forcing somebody to do something, um, right, well, they'll do it, but they're, okay, here I am, let's talk. Oh, yeah, I'm great, and then I leave, you know. Uh, the recovery, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, they have a really good motto. We want to be a program of attraction, not promotion, and I think that's, I think it's going to take some more people doing what Christian and I have done and talk about it, just blasting it wide open. But yeah, there's requirements, but that's, is it really there because they care about people or is it there because they want to cover their butts when somebody gets out and has problems? I don't know. Either way, it needs to be like, it's just part of the deal. Uh, back to the dogs. Oh, when you were saying that they need more care after they've retired, are you suggesting that they have had some psychological trauma or just more physical care? Yeah, I'm not a dog psychologist, but I'm betting that, you know, if they're violent and they've been in a lot of fights, I'm, I'm just betting that they're probably affected by that. Their treatment uh, is probably different than ours. I think they just need to live with a family and, you know, the dogs that are capable of it. Uh, but the physical stuff is what I'm talking about. You know, I live in the social media world a little bit because it's how we raise a lot of money. So 
in any time there's a dynamic canine jumping and chasing a criminal down and you're watching it from the helicopter, everybody's like, oh, that's a great dog. Well, inevitably, those dogs involved in those things, they break teeth, they have injuries to their legs, and so they get them fixed quick, and then the dog goes out and goes back to work like us, but when they retire, all that stuff, you know, it becomes an issue. And the, the people who adopt those dogs when they retire are generally the police family that that the dog has worked with or somebody in that department or with the military it's a military person they don't have the kind of you know disposable income to make sure that those dogs are cared for dogs they get beat up man i've seen dogs biting people getting hit with rocks and guns thrown off of buildings I've, they 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 suffer some physical trauma excuse me i can't i can't read the uh website of your organization. SpikesCanineFund.org. That's the one that gets the equipment for the dogs. Yes, sir. And I have a bookmark that I'll give you if you buy 20 books. <laughs> I'm kidding. I've, I've got a bookmark for you. If I buy one, will you give me one twentieth of a bookmark? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. By the way, one other quick note on the dogs and the adoption of the ones who have maybe experienced trauma is Jimmy takes many of them in. And when you visit Jimmy at his house, there are often a handful of dogs that are, in his way of thinking, unusually difficult and can't just go into a new home as a friendly adopted pet. Um, that's from the local, you know, the local shelter. And some of these dogs are, are, are traumatized. And you've had some dogs that have basically been able to exist in your world, which is as tolerant of the world as, as they'll ever find. But some have had a hard time coming back from the world that they've been in. Yeah, I mean, they solve things through violence. So it's always an option to them, you know. Really, I'm, I want some more food. You're not going to give it to me, and well, we're going to fight. You know? So I've got some bu some pretty good scars on my arms. But is it funny that I get bit? That's not funny. It's traumatic. I think that uh, Islam and Christianity can coexist. For sure. For sure, I do. I'm, I uh, I believe that that it. I believe it, that they kind of have to. I mean, what's the choice? We, we've been trying for a long time to kill our way out of some of these conflicts, and it's just, I'm, I'm a big advocate for it. Don't get me wrong, you know, but I don't think that we can solve things like that. And so I think we have to figure out how to maybe wrap up these religious differences a little bit, so that we can maybe not be as extreme as sometimes people are. And, and I think maybe giving a voice to the less extreme, making that popular in some way. Smart people like you guys need to figure out how to do that. Uh, because the, the voices we hear the most are the most extreme. And people are afraid. And I think that there are people who benefit both whether they're pick a faith. There are people who when Afghanistan is a great example. Uh, whoever the group in town is with the biggest guns, that's who they're with, right? Because they're afraid. And they've learned that we just got to be loyal to whoever's coming in with the most power. I think when people use fear as a way to influence a population or a community, uh, that's problematic. And so we need to be careful about that. I think we had, need to have less extreme voices. One thing I'd say about that, in the book you'll see, Jimmy was not at war with Islam in any way, shape, or form. It's very interesting, actually, the experiences he had along those lines. I won't give them away. But there are some surprising moments of commonality, which surprised you, with people on the ground, people who've been under the thumb of some of the stuff you're just talking about. So it really isn't quite as binary as sometimes we're often told it is when you're actually there on the ground. I think it's fair to say. I remember one night before a mission, the chaplain came out and... Uh, we would gather in a group before we went and got on the helicopters. We'd have a last-minute brief and do like a, an equipment check or whatever, or get last-minute intel stuff. And we were in a part of Ramadi, which is a pretty urban, rough neighborhood. And I remember the call to prayer was going so we could hear it, you know, in the mosque. And then the chaplain came out, and I remember he was saying, bless these men to smite the enemy. And I'm like, they're saying the same things. <laughs> it's just a matter of which club you're in right now, because this is the same stuff, right? So I just think there needs to be less smiting, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it, but does that answer it? 
uh, from the time that you went to the recruiter station or wherever it was that you uh, decided to join the military, what, if it, what became the most surprising thing about the military from, from what you had anticipated it to be? Uh, the most surprising thing to me about the military is that anything actually gets done. It's such a bureaucratic machine uh, and it's the little teeny pockets of groups that I thought it was this well-organized machine that everybody, all the fish are swimming in the same direction, and it's not. <laughs> I wish I could say something a little more positive, but it gets done anyway. It just, it's in spite of itself almost, you know? It's kind of like a self-licking lollipop. You know what I mean? It's, it's a crazy thing. There's some of that in the book, too. I have one question from the shy lady in the back. Uh, the story of your walking cane. Yeah, so I got shot in the leg, and it blew my uh, femur uh, apart, and I limp. And I don't need the cane, but people like it when I carry it. And I, and I can use it to hit people that might say something that they shouldn't. No, I'm kidding. I, I, it just helps me get around. Thank you. Thank you. And I can get through airport security with it. Go ahead. It's good. It's time to wrap up. So thank you so much to James and for Christian for coming and talking. And... Uh, Please, please buy a copy of the book. It's for sale up front and come on up and...